Portland cement concrete used in building roads and structures must meet rigid specifications in order to ensure high quality and a long pavement life. The department's Portland cement concrete sampling and testing procedures assure that these specifications are met. This video will discuss the sampling and testing of plastic concrete and instruct you in the proper ways to conduct the necessary tests. Generally, the sampling and testing of Portland cement concrete consists of four tests. S301 sampling fresh concrete. TR207 slump of Portland cement concrete. TR202 air content of freshly mixed concrete. and TR-226 making, field curing, and transporting concrete test specimens. A complete list of necessary equipment can be found in the materials sampling manual and the testing procedures manual. On the first batch of the day, quality control tests for slump and air must be taken at the job site just before placing any concrete in the forms. Sampling for quality control tests may be taken at any point in the batch. Concrete for acceptance and independent assurance tests will be sampled from the middle of the batch. Before taking the sample, assemble all necessary equipment and have it ready to use when needed. Careful preparation will make the entire procedure flow more smoothly and avoid needless delay of the contractor. When sampling plastic concrete, you may take the sample from a transport with a discharge chute, a transport or mixer without a discharge chute, or from a pump discharge. The three methods are slightly different. When taking the sample from a transport or mixer with a discharge chute, release enough concrete to coat the discharge chute with mortar. A wheelbarrow makes a good container because it is large enough to hold adequate material for testing and it can be used to transport the sample to its testing location. All sampling containers must be cleaned to prevent contamination of the sample. Place the container as close as possible to the end of the discharge chute. Allowing the concrete to fall too far from the chute to the sampling container will cause segregation. Be sure to catch the entire width of the stream of concrete. To take a sample from a transport without a discharge chute, discharge the contents of the transport into a pile onto the prepared subgrade. Using the sampling shovel or trowel, obtain enough concrete to perform the necessary tests, combining the material from at least five different locations in the pile. Take care not to pick up any subgrade material with the concrete sample. When sampling from a pump, have the operator pump enough concrete through the discharge tubes to lubricate them and ensure a sample that is representative of the batch. Place the sampling container as close as possible to the end of the discharge tubes and collect the sample. Note the time when you obtain the sample. Testing with the material in the sample must be completed within 15 minutes. Check the temperature of the concrete sample with a thermometer. Wait until the thermometer is stabilized about two to three minutes and obtain the reading. Move the concrete sample out of the way of construction activity and out of the wind and direct sunlight where testing will be undisturbed. As soon as the sample has been transported to its testing location, remix the sample to ensure that it is uniform throughout. Remix the sample quickly using a trowel or shovel and only enough to ensure uniformity. Too much remixing can cause segregation. Next, we will cover DOTD designation TR-207, slump of Portland cement concrete. The slump test is used to determine consistency of concrete mixtures containing aggregates less than 50 millimeters or 2 inches in diameter. Before performing the test, inspect the mold for damage. The mold must be mortar tight and free from dents and holes. Ensure that the foot plates and handles are firmly attached. Finally, check to make sure there is no concrete buildup as this would cause friction and yield erroneous test results. Use a tapping rod which is 16 millimeters or 5 eighths of an inch in diameter and 610 millimeters or 24 inches long and round and smooth with a rounded tip. Do not use a reinforcing bar as a tapping rod. The slump test will require at least a one-half cubic foot or two one-hundredths cubic meter sample of concrete obtained in accordance with S301 sampling fresh concrete. A level non-absorbent surface must be used as a work base. 
A discarded traffic sign makes a good work base, but only if it is placed on something stable. Unless it is heavy duty, a traffic sign will flex during the test. Plywood does not make an acceptable work base because it can absorb the water from the concrete, yielding erroneous test results. The area of the test must be free from vibration. For example, testing for slump too near the concrete vibrators, machine motors, or heavy equipment will cause the concrete to slump excessively. To start the test, dampen the slump mold and the work base to ensure no effect on the moisture content of the concrete. Don't leave any water standing on the work base. Extra water on the work base would be absorbed by the concrete and would affect the slump. Hold the mold firmly in place while filling by standing on the two foot plates. Place the fresh concrete evenly in the mold. Mold the fresh concrete in three successive layers. Rod each layer with a tapping rod 25 times to uniformly consolidate the concrete. The strokes must be distributed uniformly over the surface of each layer. Incline the rod slightly to consolidate the mix near the sides of the mold for each layer. About half the stroke should be near the edge. The other half should be in a spiral pattern towards the center. Rod the bottom layer throughout its step without striking the work base with the tapping rod. The remaining layers should be rotted throughout their depth so that the strokes just penetrate the layer beneath. After rotting each of the three layers, level each surface with a tapping rod. Heap the mix above the mold on the last layer before rotting. Maintain an excess of mix at all times while rotting the top layer. If the concrete goes below the top edge of the mold, put more concrete on the top to bring the level back above the top of the mold. When rotting is complete, strike off the excess concrete with a straight edge. Use a screeding motion across the top of the mold. Remove any spilled concrete from the work base and the mold. The surface of the concrete should be flush with the top of the mold. Remove the mold immediately. To do this, stand directly over the mold. Use the handles to hold the mold in place when stepping off the foot plates. Carefully raise the mold straight up. Do not rotate the mold or move it sideways. The mold must be raised in approximately five seconds. Note that there is a maximum time limit on the slump test. The operation from the start of the filling through the removal of the mold must be done without interruption and must be completed within two minutes. The entire operation from the time the sample is taken to the removal of the mold is to be completed within five minutes. To measure the slump, set the mold on the work base next to the specimen. Hold the tapping rod on the top of the mold so that it projects horizontally over the specimen. Measure straight down from the underside of the rod to a point directly above the original center of the specimen. Read the ruler to the nearest five millimeters or quarter of an inch. If a decided falling away or shearing off of concrete from one side or portion of the mass occurs, do not measure slump. Resample and perform a new test on the new sample. If shear occurs more than once, the concrete lacks the necessary plasticity and cohesiveness for the slump test to be performed and the mix is not acceptable. Always clean the concrete completely from the equipment immediately after each test. Use a brush or cloth and some water. If concrete builds up on the mold, it will become unusable. The friction from the build-up concrete will invalidate slump results and it will no longer be possible to calibrate the mold. Document the test results in accordance with the manual Application of Quality Assurance Specifications for Portland Cement Concrete Pavements and Structures. Next, we will cover DOTD TR202 Air Content of Freshly Mixed Concrete. When an air entrainment mixture is used and the specifications require an air content, 
the concrete must be tested to determine the amount of air in the concrete. The proper amount of air ensures the workability and durability of the concrete mix. We will discuss only method A, the volumetric method. Concrete with a design slump of 25 millimeters or one inch or greater will be tested by method A using an air meter, more commonly known as a rollometer. For an explanation of method B, the pressure method, refer to the testing procedures manual. Before beginning the test, inspect the rollometer for any damage and concrete buildup. Do not use the rollometer if it has any dents or concrete buildup, which could yield erroneous test results. The air test will require a one quarter cubic foot sample of concrete. Using the scoop, place the fresh concrete in the bowl in one layer. Rod the concrete 25 times with a tamping rod to consolidate the sample. Make vertical strokes in a spiral pattern toward the center, uniformly distributing the strokes over the surface of each layer. Penetrate the entire depth of the concrete without damaging the bottom of the bowl. After the concrete has been consolidated, gently tap the sides of the bowl 10 to 15 times using a rubber mallet to eliminate voids and to release any large air bubbles caused by the consolidation effort. Do not use a metal object to tap the bowl because that could damage the bowl. Strike off excess concrete with the straight edge. Using a sawing motion with a slow forward and backward movement, be careful to finish the surface of the concrete flush with the top of the bowl. Do not use the tamping rod to finish the surface of the concrete because its rounded shape will not properly smooth the surface. Wipe all concrete from the flange of the bowl. It is critical that the flange be perfectly clean to ensure a proper seal. Even a grain of sand can break the seal causing a leak and yielding erroneous test results. Remove the screw cap and carefully clamp the top section over the bowl. Insert the funnel and add water until the water level approaches the zero mark on the gauge. Remove the funnel and adjust the water level until the bottom of the meniscus, the curved surface of the water, is level with the zero mark. Use the syringe to add water gradually. If you add too much water, use the syringe to remove some of the water. When the water level is even with a zero mark, attach and tighten the screw cap. Wipe the outside of the meter and check for any leaks that might appear where the top section and the bowl meet. If a leak appears, discard the specimen and start over. Escaping water will yield an incorrect extra high air content. Invert the meter and agitate it until the concrete is free from the base. Rest the top section on a stable work base. Hold the roller meter by the flange and rotate it in both directions to dislodge the concrete from the bowl and permit it to fall into the top section. Gently tap the bottom of the roller meter with a rubber mallet to help dislodge the concrete. Through experience, you can tell from the sound and feel when the concrete breaks loose. Do not drop or bang the meter to dislodge the concrete. Place the roller meter on its side and rest the flange on plywood. Tilt the roller meter so that the base is approximately one half inch from the surface of the plywood. Be sure the neck is slightly elevated to allow material to drift out of the neck and back into the bowl. With the neck elevated, roll and rock the unit for approximately one or two minutes. Set the roller meter upright, jar it slightly, then wait for the air to rise to the top. Check the water level. Repeat the entire agitation procedure, inverting, rolling, and rocking. 
until no further drop in the water level is observed. Return the rollometer to an upright position and remove the screw cap. Using the syringe and the measuring cup furnished with the rollometer, add enough alcohol in one cup increments to dispel the foamy mass on the surface of the water. The measuring cup is equal to 1% of the volume of the bowl. Spray the entire cross section with the measured amounts of alcohol. Be very careful to measure the exact amount of alcohol in the cup because the alcohol, if improperly measured, will cause erroneous results. You may use as many cupfuls as necessary to dispel the foam, but only to the extent that the liquid level does not go above the zero mark. After you have dispelled the foam with the alcohol, wait until the bubbling is stopped. The higher the cement content, the longer it will bubble. Take the reading where the meniscus becomes stable. The scale on the meter reads from zero at the top to nine at the bottom. Each cup of alcohol added takes up one unit on the scale and consequently reduces the reading by one unit. Therefore, the number of cups of alcohol placed in the meter must be added to the final reading to get the percent of entrained air. Read the level of the liquid in the neck, reading the bottom of the meniscus to the nearest gradation on the rollometer. Gradations on the meter are in half percent increments. To obtain the air content, Add the number of cups of alcohol which were added to disperse the foam to the reading of the water column. One cup of alcohol equals 1% air. If you open the bowl and find material stuck in the edges, the test must be rerun. The test must be completed within 15 minutes of taking the sample. Always clean all the concrete from the equipment immediately after each test. Use a brush or cloth and water for this purpose. Document test results in accordance with the application of quality assurance specifications for Portland cement concrete pavements and structures. Now we will cover DOTD designation TR-226, making field curing and transporting concrete test specimens. This segment will demonstrate the making of cylinders for compressive strength testing only. Approved single-use plastic molds or approved reusable metal molds may be used for molding cylinders for compressive strength testing. All cylinder molds shall conform to the dimensions, color, and type of material specified in AASHTO M205 and DOTD TR226. The standard size of specimens for compressive strength testing is 150 millimeters by 300 millimeters or 6 inches by 12 inches. Metal molds are primarily used at pre-stressed concrete plants. If reusable metal molds are being used, assemble the molds to base plates and lightly coat the inner surface of each mold with an approved form release agent. Also coat the joints with a waterproof sealant such as petroleum jelly to prevent leakage. There must be no leakage of concrete through the joints. Single-use plastic molds shall not be reused. The sample for molding cylinders for compressive strength testing must be taken at mid-batch in accordance with DOTD S301 in the Materials Sampling Manual. For specimens that are to be used for putting structures into service, form removal or acceptance of concrete, the location of molding shall be as near as possible to the portion of the structure or structural member represented by the specimens. The cylinders must be stored where they are made until transport to their testing location. This storage location must be free of vibration and suitable to store the cylinders without their being disturbed in any way until they are moved or transported to the testing facility. Each complete set of three cylinders must be molded from the same sample. Each sample taken for molding cylinders must be used within 15 minutes after the sample is taken. If the 15-minute time limit is exceeded after completing a set of cylinders and additional cylinders are needed, a new sample must be obtained. Place the molds on a level, rigid horizontal surface, free from vibration and other disturbances at the location where they are to be stored for the first 20 hours. If you are using single-use plastic molds, identify each specimen by writing on the side of the cylinder mold with a black ink marker, the sample number, 
lot number, project number, and date of pour. Using a scoop or trowel, place the concrete into the cylinder mold in an even layer that will yield approximately one-third the volume of the mold. When placing the concrete, move the scoop or trowel around the perimeter of the mold opening to ensure an even distribution of the concrete and to minimize segregation. Level the layer of concrete in the mold by using a circular motion with a tapping rod. Rod the layer a total of 25 times with a tamping rod using vertical strokes, taking care to uniformly distribute the strokes over the surface of the concrete. Rod the first layer throughout its depth without damaging the bottom of the mold. When using a reusable metal mold, lightly tap the side of the mold 10 to 15 times with a rubber mallet to remove any air voids. When using a single-use plastic mold, use either the mallet or the open palm of your hand. Tap around the circumference of the mold at the midpoint of each layer. Do not strike the side of the mold with a tapping rod. The second and third layers are placed in the same manner as the first layer. When rotting the second layer, penetrate 10 millimeters or about one half inch into the first layer. When rotting the third layer, slightly penetrate 10 millimeters into the second layer. When placing the final layer, slightly overfill the mold no greater than 10 millimeters or one half inch. After the top layer has been rotted, strike off the surface of the concrete with a straight edge until the surface is smooth and level with the top of the mold. It is critical to achieve a level smooth finish on the top of the mold. The surface can have no depression or projection greater than 1 8 inch or 3.2 millimeters. If the top surface is not smooth and even, adjustments must be made during compressive strength testing or the cylinder may be rejected, invalidating test results. Cover each cylinder immediately with a polyethylene bag or plastic cap and secure the bag with a rubber band. This will serve to prevent moisture loss from the specimen. Do not allow the polyethylene bag to come in contact with the fresh concrete. If you are using reusable metal molds, identify the specimen by removing the polyethylene bag or plastic cap and labeling the specimen with a black ink marker. Be sure to wait until the concrete is hard enough that you can write on top with a marker without marring the cylinder. Document the molding of cylinders in accordance with the application of quality assurance specifications for Portland cement concrete pavement and structures. Clean all equipment immediately after completing the molding operation. Once the cylinders are marked and covered, acceptance cylinders must be stored undisturbed at the job site for 20 hours before they can be sent to the district laboratory for additional curing and testing. Cylinders for early strength determination or form removal are stored at the job site until ready for testing. The way a concrete cylinder is stored has an important influence on its strength development. Cylinders are transported to the district laboratory in approved transport boxes which cushion the cylinder and protect it from damage. Handle cylinders carefully when packing them for transport. Both department acceptance of the material and the payment to the contractor depend on the cylinder being in good condition when it is tested. Laboratory curing and compressive strength testing is then performed by the district laboratory in accordance with DOTD TR-230 of the testing procedures manual. You should now have a much clearer picture of the Portland cement concrete sampling and testing procedures and their importance to quality construction. For any questions, consult the materials sampling manual or the testing procedures manual or the accompanying manual sampling and testing of plastic concrete. <laughs>